Your plan for mankind begins to unfold. You had us on your mind. When you decided to perfectly place man in your world, you chose to place him in our motherland. Throughout Holy Scripture and throughout our history, we have witnessed your hidden power and we have been recipients of your love and grace. We shall ever be mindful of how you brought us together after the Middle Passage, delivered us from the chains of slavery, and carried us through the Civil Rights Movement. We thank you, dear Savior, for the gifts, talents, and blessings you have poured out upon us. Thank you, gracious Lord, for including us in your divine plan. May we always remember your love toward us, O God. Amen. Please join me in singing our praise song, Glad to be in this service. What do we believe? 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on his cross's power, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please make ready for a reading of our second scripture, as noted earlier, Acts the 14th chapter, the first seven verses, Acts the 14th chapter, the first seven verses. Now, it happened in Iconium that they went together in the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they strayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hand. But the multitude of the city was divided, part siding with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent a rough attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it fled to Lystra and Deborah, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May each of you allow God's word to take residence in your heart. Amen. This is Black History Month, not that we need a special month to do what we need to do, but we have asked um, if Judge Ingram would come and share with us a special moment in Black History. <coughs> Amen. Give the Lord a prayer. Amen.
70s when it was difficult to figure out the best way to get our schools integrated and functioning so it would serve all the members of our community. Back in the 70s. In the late 70s, there was a protest for the employees of, it's not Kmart, but what Kmart used to be. And there was an order issued by Judge Baird, and because of his commitment to those employees, black and white, he went to jail. I remember standing right beside when the judge said, you're going to jail for five days for contempt, for violating the restraining order when they were only protesting the treatment of those employees. Well, the interesting thing about that is that he went. I remember standing right beside him and saying, well, here you're going to jail today. He went. And the next day, the judge called me to say, well, what can you do? What can we do to get him out? Why? Because he was organizing the folks in the jail. So they came to get him out. That's not legal. Now, in 1982, the school board of Tuscaloosa City decided they were going to change their grading system in the middle of the semester, which would have resulted in most of the African Americans attending public school failing. Well, and often, well, SCLC, and we'll call them the Super Six. That was Odessa Warwick, Reverend Gordon, Ms. Croom, Charles Steele, among those persons, six, stayed sitting at the school board for three weeks, never leaving until the school board relented and said, we got to give those kids an opportunity to fail, to, to pass. That's my leader. Then my leader, my leader, not only did that, but in 1993, when a group of citizens all over the world met in Gabon, I watched them take leadership roles, not just in Tuscaloosa County, but in the world at that conference of African Americans and Africans in Gabon in 1993. And then, of course, we all know about 1986, well, 85, when he became one of the first African Americans to serve on the Tuscaloosa City Council. And so here we have an individual who started as president of the Tuscaloosa chapter. When John Nellis passed the statewide, became president of SCLC statewide, and then after doing two terms on the U.S., not the U.S., should have been on the U.S., but the Alabama Senate, he became national president. That's the Black History Month, one of ours, Charles Steele Jr. Thank you. I just got to say, I aspire to be the kind of leader that when they punish you, they got to unpunish you because you still me. Hey, that's true. <laughs> We're all <laughs> Amen. That's a good example of us to follow, too. And uh, I. We got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is it's giving time. The bad news is you might not want to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's necessary. If you look at the injustices that were perpetrated on people by uh, Ioana there, you know that we are in a time of where we need to support one another. 
And we need to do that by our giving. The church is an organism that is supposed to go out and do the will of God. And by doing that, we face injustices that sometimes seem insurmountable, but with God, nothing is impossible. But if we give, God has promised us that he would give back to us blessings Shake down, shaken down, rest together, running over. And as the scripture of Reverend Wilson read, it confirms that God has said that He would give us those blessings if we obey that condition. And we have several ways of giving here at Bay. One, if you're worshiping in person, or if you need an offering envelope. They are at the back as we enter and as we leave. You can put your offering in one of those baskets by the doors as you exit after the benediction. From your computer or iPhone, we have the Givelify app or the website for Baby Tabernacle CME Church. And from your computer or iPhone, we can use the PayPal app, paypal.me. And if you're not computer savvy, we have the old standby, place where I retired from, United States Postal Service. We still deliver the mail, whether it's rain, shine, sleet, snow, or bloom of night. You can mail your check or money order. Please do not mail any cash, because there are books in places where you might not get Please do not mail any cash. Mail your check or money order to Bailey Tabernacle CME Church, Post Office Box 3145, Tuscaloosa, Alabama 35403. And we ask that you still be continue to be faithful in supporting the ongoing work of Bailey Tabernacle CME Church. Once you give. Christianity is under attack. It's not only attack here in our community, it's under attack around the world. Mr. Putin has threatened nuclear war by moving nuclear weapons into position to fire on Ukraine. And whether you believe it or not, Russia is in the Bible to lead a war against Israel. If we ever needed prayer, we need it now. When the church went into prayer for Peter, who was supposed to be executed by Herod the next day, it had already taken John's life. And Peter was on death row to be executed the next morning. The church went into prayer for Peter. That corporate body, they never ceased praying until God answered their prayer. God answered their prayer. But Peter was so confident he could go to sleep, knowing that he might die the next day. But his confidence in God allowed him to sleep and rest in the Lord. Because he knew that God would deliver him. And when they delivered, when uh, he was delivered, and Rhoda went to the door and went back and told him that it was Peter there, they said, No, it's his goat, because they figured that Herod had to be his man. But God is faithful. If he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And I'm a living witness, too, that God will do what he said. And that's why I think this man. But 
from Ben Wilson. Because when I was at door, death doorstep, God delivered me. And he brought me through. And I'm standing here today 18 years after my heart stopped beating twice. And on that operating table. So I know God will do what he said as he will do. If you give and if you pray and ask him for forgiveness, he's just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Doesn't matter what you did, the, the devil is gonna bring up stuff. But it won't worry about him. Be faithful and honest in prayer like the church will. And pray to God and allow him to manifest himself in your life. And to do what he always does. Show up and show up. Won't you give? Won't you pray?
I couldn't figure out what was the story they were talking about. And was the song the song that was the story? And then as I grew and experienced life and all its glory and ugliness, I began to understand that the praise we give to God, the act of praising myself, that is my story. The very act of raising up praise to the Lord is a song unto itself. And as I have gone through what I have gone through, I have discovered that there is no better story to tell than the story of the praise you give to the Lord. Amen. There is no greater song to sing than the praise that you can pour forth from your heart, even when you can't find the melody. Even when you don't fully understand the words, even when the chapter of your story you are on is a tragedy, the fact that you have a story is reason enough to give God some praise. The fact that you have, you have a, a song in your heart, even when you don't feel like it's enough reason to give God some praise. So this is my story. My story might be ugly, but this is my story. This is my song. My life might be on me, but this is my song. And I give praise to my Savior. Oh! Thank you so much, choir, for your for your faithful and beautiful ministry. But there's a word from the Lord. And I have to try and deliver. So once more I ask you to pray for me. And pray with me. Father. As you hear and as you write our story, as you hear and help us to sing our song, we ask you to speak your word, to use your preacher of this moment, despite all that holds me back and holds me down. Let your word go forth with power and decision. Make every word of mine. Make every meditation of my heart to see it separately in your sight. But let me, Lord, let me get in the only place where I can stand to be right now. Let me rest in the shadow of the cross. Hide me in the cleft of the rock. And let us all our focus to Jesus. In his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Do you ever watch the news and think, didn't we already do this? <laughs> Ebola, West Nile, avian flu, Spanish flu, COVID gamma, COVID delta. Don't you remember when it was just COVID-19? I mean, didn't we already go through this? Gas prices rising with no end in sight. Inflation out of control. Commodities from overseas held up or, or withheld. Some of us remember doing this before. Governors and senators denying history, withholding knowledge from the people in the name of patriotism and unity. An international superpower invading a weaker East European nation and the, and the rest of Europe and the United States having to figure out how to stop them before they gobble up more countries. Didn't we do that at least twice already? Amen. All right. Innocent black Americans gunned down by police and white citizens in protest in response. I know we've done this already. All right. The French call it Deja vu. The Bible calls it Ecclesiastes 1 verses 9 through 10. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. 
And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything, the Bible? Is there really anything of which it may be said, see, this is new, but it has already been in ancient times before us. Time, we figure out, is not so much a line as a spiral. History flows in cycles. Human activity follows patterns. And, and those patterns are neither good nor bad. It, it just is how it is. The problem, though, is expressed in the next verse, Ecclesiastes 1 and 11. There is no regard of former things or no remembrance of former things. Nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who come after. See, the problem isn't that we keep confronting the same situations. The problem is that we keep making the same mistakes. Amen. So today I'm going to tell you two stories. One, a tragic but true story from American history. And the other, a tragic but true story from Scripture. And I will lay before you a charge to listen, to notice the pattern, and to break the cycle. The title of today's message is, We Don't Have to Run No More. We Don't Have to Run No More. After the Civil War, Wilmington, North Carolina, with its bustling port and vibrant culture, became the economic jewel of the state. Wilmington's prosperity included a thriving black middle class made of professionals and artisans, industrial workers, shipping workers, domestics, and entrepreneurs. Wilmington even had a black-owned daily newspaper, the Daily Record, owned by Alfred Mann. But most remarkable, Wilmington, North Carolina, in the 1890s, was a stronghold of what was called the Fusionist Party. The Fusionist Party drew from Republicans and Democrats, brought together black people, white people, immigrants, laborers, and the emerging middle class across all racial lines. The Fusion Party's people came together to promote their common interests in justice and equal access to economic opportunity. And fusion party candidates won elections, especially in Wilmington. Life was good at first. But then a few rich former Confederate officers launched a plan to seek fear in the white working class majority and steal the 1898 election. And, and this plan, it was not some secret conspiracy because the, the most popular newspaper in the state, the Raleigh News and Observer, ran cartoons and front page articles explaining the plan, which they labeled the White Supremacy Campaign. I'm not even joking. <laughs> they literally called it in the newspaper the White Supremacy Campaign. The day before the 1898 election in Wilmington, a former congressman and Confederate general addressed a room of more than a thousand white men and said, it, I quote, you are the sons of noble ancestors. You are Anglo-Saxon. You are armed and prepared, and you will do your duty. Go to the polls tomorrow, and if you find the Negro out voting, tell him to leave the polls. If he refuses, <coughs> kill him. Shoot him down in his tracks. Despite the propaganda, the Fusionist Party won in the election. And so the day after the election, another white newspaper, the Wilmington Messenger, published what was called, in the paper, the White Declaration of Independence. It was a list of resolutions promising that whites would never again be ruled by men of African origin. That blacks would no longer be allowed to vote, that white men would be given a large part of their employment heretofore given to Negroes. 
And the day after that, 2,000 white men burned that black newspaper office to the ground, attacked every black business and citizen they could find. And though the full number of those murdered that day will never be known, we know that at least 60 African Americans were killed. The mob, who considered themselves to be true patriots, occupied government buildings in Wilmington, rounded up prominent black citizens and their white allies, marched them down to the train station, and ordered them to leave town or be killed and never to come back. And when this happened, Wilmington, North Carolina, in 1898, neither the state nor the federal government did anything. Nothing. So let me review. Candidates representing cross racial harm legitimately won the election. But thousands of angry and violent white people showed up afterwards to overturn the election anyway. They destroyed property, they occupied government buildings, and they threatened the lives of legitimate elected leaders. And the federal government did nothing to stop it. Does it sound like we've done this before? Or rather, does it sound like we did this again? In the weeks following what has been known as the Wilmington Massacre, thousands of black people fled the city. And that 1898 massacre in Wilmington provided the inspiration and the tactics for so-called race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rome, Florida, and locations across the South. Soon, all the gains that have been made under Reconstruction were rolled back. Jim Crow segregation became the law of the land. White mobs had a free hand to rob, disenfranchise, rape, and lynch. And over the next few years, six million African Americans decided that their best option was to flee the South in such numbers that it became known as the Great Migration. Do you see the pattern? The majority at first are open to the truth of justice and peace, but a jealous minority of powerful persons poisons the minds of the majority, and then a corrupted majority turns on the speakers of truth and with vicious violence, so, so, so horrible and ferocious that the former allies have to either hide or flee. And that hatred spreads and multiplies like a, like a virus in full pandemic. Remember the past. Remember the history. Our ancestors had to run. But if we learn from the past, we don't have to run them. Now turn to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 opens with Paul and Barnabas in another city, in another synagogue, preaching Jesus to another congregation of, of their brothers and sisters, the ethnic Jews, and the Gentiles who had come over to Judea. And just like last time, Things went very well at first. Acts 14, 1 states that a great multitude of both Jews and of the Greeks believed in Jesus. But then, verse 2 says, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, poisoned their minds against the brothers. Now, numerically, in the Roman Empire, Jews were a minority, and Gentiles were the vast majority. But in the synagogue, Jews were the people with high status and authority, and the Gentiles were the lower class. Verse 2 says that the higher class folks in the system stirred up the lower class majority. The few poisoned the minds of the many and the many who looked at them for leadership and moral guidance fell into a conspiracy to create division. 
And by Acts 14, verse 5, the poison of the leadership class had turned what had first been a receptive majority into a group of planned, directed, targeted violence. Acts 14, 5. A violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone the apostles. Acts 14.5 records the New Testament equivalent of a lynch mob. The apostles, when this happened, they had no choice but, as Acts 14.5 said, 14.6 says, to flee. They fled to Lystra and Derby, the cities of Lyconia. They fled all over the surrounding region. And when you come down a few verses in Acts 14, 19, it tells us that the Jews from Antioch and Iconium found them where they were, persuaded the multitudes in those cities, and they found Paul, stoned him, dragged him out of the city, and left him for dead. At first, the community received the word of truth and peace in Jesus Christ. But then, Jealous by me, poisoned the minds of the Gentile majority, stirred them up to violence against apostles who were just telling them the truth. And the corrupted majority persecuted them with such vicious violence, and violence that infected the region, that all the apostles could do was run away. Do you see the path? In the book of Acts, the apostles had to continually flee lynch mobs, but still, God made even their flight work together for the good of the kingdom. Amen. Because the cities to which Paul and Barnabas leaped for were in a region called Galatia. And each perilous stop brought more souls to faith in Jesus Christ. Among those souls was a young man named Timothy. Against this constant threat of persecution, new saints were strengthened by the Holy Spirit. New believers became pillars of churches, and that became the impetus for letters which became Scripture. Right. Right. When the Lord did through them, the Lord can do through us. Amen. In fact, in fact, for us, the opportunity to reach people for Jesus, the, the potential to change the direction of communities and nations is today greater than anything that could have been imagined by the apostles. On his best day, an apostle could move only as fast as a donkey or a ship on the sea. At his most prolific, Paul could only write one letter at a time and wait for it to be copied by hand one letter at a time. But the worship video that we are posting today is already going out to the other side of the planet. Right. As Jesus promised, greater works than these we will do. Yes, yes. We have the opportunity to continue the great commission of Matthew 28 to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Amen. baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen. and teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. We have the opportunity to advance the biblical command of Isaiah 56. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness is to be revealed. And so, we have the opportunity to do greater things and to do what I have to run in. Because Through Moses, the Lord made a promise. Mm. Deuteronomy 28, 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe all his commandments which I command you, the Lord will set you high above all nations of the earth. And that promise blessing includes Deuteronomy 28, verse 7. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and flee before you seven. Right. Through Joshua, the Lord 
declared in Joshua 23 10, one man of you shall chase a thousand. And the Lord God is he who fights for you as he has already promised. Right. Supposedly, we are told, Jesus has given white Christians to serve it as a, a God given right to bear arms and beat protesters. But supposedly, the same Jesus has told black Christians to forgive their enemies and to bear beatings non violent And mostly, we've been told, <laughs> to just shut up about it. This stuff, this propaganda, these lies, part of an old pattern. But the Lord has declared that we don't have to worry about it. Right. And Luke 4, when an angry mob came for Jesus in Nazareth, it says that the Lord left because his hour was not yet come. Again, in John chapters 9, chapters 8 and 10, when the lynch mark came with stones and trumped up charges, Jesus slipped away because an hour had not yet come. But a time came when the Lord Jesus rolled into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And from then to the cross, Jesus stood his ground. Right. Jesus met his enemies in the temple daily. He taught and he healed and he braided a whip and he flipped over their tables. Jesus publicly spoke prophetic truth in the face of jealous and corrupt power. And when the traitor brought God and all the other disciples fled, Jesus stood his ground. Amen. Now he didn't stand his ground with power. He even rebuked Trigger Happy P. Tell him to put the sword back in its place. For those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. But Jesus stood his ground in the power of truth. Jesus faced his enemies and overcame them in the battleground of our demons. And we like to yell and sing and hoop about how Jesus was silent before his accusers, how he never said a one the word. But then you read the gospel. And, and if you have Jesus' words in red letters, you see a whole lot of red when Jesus was facing his accusers. You see, Jesus never said an unnecessary word, but he did talk back. Matthew 26, verses 60 through 64. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power, coming out of the clouds of heaven. Amen. See, Jesus didn't chit chat and tweet all the time, but when they questioned his identity, when they questioned his right to be who he was, Jesus did answer. And when he answered, I guarantee you, it wasn't a mumble. Yeah. Jesus said, it is as you see. Nevertheless, I say to you. If I may translate that into the vernacular of Mississippi, Jesus said, your dog won't write me, tell you something else. In Luke 23, when Herod wanted Jesus to do something entertaining. Jesus said nothing. But in John 18 verse 37, when, when Pilate said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered. He said, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Translation, Jesus told Pilate, you dog are right. And I tell you something else. We don't need to entertain every little argument with every little person. But when the enemy tries to deny who you are, when the enemy tries to make you deny who you are, when the enemy tries to question your right to fully be the king and the queen that God has made you to be, you don't have to shut your mouth. 
When the time comes, don't, don't shrink from your right and responsibility to do battle in the arena of ideas. We are, we are going through in this moment and when it's just another cycle of the same old hard times all over again. But you don't know right. We trust that the God who brought us through before is going to see us through again. The, the enemy wants to scare you into silence. The enemy wants to deceive you into despair so that when he comes to kill and steal and destroy, all you'll do is flee. But we are no longer ignorant of Satan's devices. When we realize we ain't got to run no more. The enemy of your soul will try to poison your mind. He'll stir up the, the mental masses with propaganda that whispers in your ear. Do you really think God loves you? Do you really believe God's going to make anything good out of that mess of a life you had? After all the pain that God has already let into your life, how can you possibly have faith in the promises of goodness and mercy all the days of your life and an eternity of joy in heaven. And when the enemy says that, you reply, you doggone wrong. Doggone right, Jesus loves me. And I tell you another thing, I know he loves me because the Bible tells us. You doggone right, God's going to make all this pain work together for good. And I tell you something else, I've seen in scripture and I've seen in history how God has formed greatness out of the lives of other imperfect men and women. And if God did it for them, I know he'll do it for me. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. And even when I'm hurting like I never hurt before, they ask me, do I still trust in God? And I can respond, dog boy. We ain't got to run from the problems no more. We, we don't have to be afraid and silent. We can stand on the promise of God and face whatever the world and the devil throws at us. Because Jesus has done it for us all.
and you might need someone to pray for you. There's one or two that's listening today who are not in this audience have heard this magnificent message. Do you think he loved you? Yes, he does. Because he says, come. If you're here today and you need special prayer, we invite you to just stand where you are. Don't be ashamed. Reverend Brown will pray for you. He doesn't know what you are experiencing, but God knows. He will pray for you. For those of you who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Jesus invites you to come because you are laboring and you are heavy laden with sin. Won't you come now? Won't you stand now? How could you sit if you are heavily laden? Just stand. For Reverend Brown to pray for you. And if you're unsaved, we ask that you would take this opportunity to make provision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by believing. Amen. Won't you come? Won't you stand right now if you need prayer? And I know I do. Brother Brown will pray. Our Father and our God, we come once again to say thank you for your blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And we realize, my Father, that even though a lot of your children are saved, but there are some who are not. There are some who may be wrestling with one thing or another in their life. They don't really know the answer, but you know all things. Whatever it is, my Father, you can heal it, you can fix it, and you can make it all brand new. So we give ourselves away this morning and allow you to control our lives. We messed it up. Adam did it first in the garden, and all of us fall under that headship of Adam sitting in that garden. But then you made a way for him. You sent your son Jesus Christ into the world to die for our sins that we might be reconciled back to the Father and be forgiven for the sins we have committed. Whatever it is you're going through, be like Peter. Have a complete trust in God that you can fall fast asleep in the midst of knowing that you will be beheaded the next morning. But God sent his angel into that jail cell. Touched Peter, woke him up, let him out, and set him free. But when they got to the house where the church was praying, the disciples didn't believe that it was Peter knocking at the door. But if God can free Peter from a death row sentence, he can handle any problem that you have. And he's willing and able to do just that if you would only trust him. Trust him today because as Reverend Wilson said, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Won't you give him your heart today and allow him to work out the things in your life, to work it out for the good of those who love and are called according to his purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you so much for your spirit, your praise, your presence. Whether your presence is physically here or wherever you are receiving this, we are just so thankful to the Lord. When we leave this place, don't be scared. We just trust in the Lord. Amen. We stand together for our doctors. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow.